to introduce now Professor Sir Antonio Terriello. He's working at the IRCCS Multimedica of Milan. And he's a very knowledge, uh, renowned scientist who's published over 500 papers with an impressive uh, uh, <clears throat> Hirsch index of uh, above 100. And very importantly, he's been sharing um, many um, different workshops also on the relevance of um, the meal uh, postprandial glycemia and he's currently also sharing the EASD um, group of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and it's a great pleasure to have you here and share some of your exciting research with us and present on the findings um, from human studies. Thank you Annette, thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for the opportunity to be together today and uh, on uh, this. Uh, this is my conflict of interest. I, I want to make uh, some prelim preliminary, um, uh, as to underline some preliminary aspects of my presentation. One is that I will speak about the mechanism through which postprandial hyperglycemia can damage organs, particularly we see the, the, um, uh, the organs involved in the cardiovascular uh, action. So this is a very specific, but probably not only related to this. And let me uh, clarify that in my opinion, this mechanism can also work in children because they are just linked, I will, we will see soon, to the effect of what happens after the ingestion of food and I say in uh, diabetes is my main area of interest. In children, we would see the complication only very late because, of course, they are healthy, uh, meaning in the, they do not have other risk factors. And usually, what happens uh, during postprandial hyperglycemia superimpose to what uh, to the, the cardiovascular risk already present, meaning that if you are adult and with diabetes. This effect of cardiovascular or post meal hyperglycemia is uh, amplifying the effect, I will see so soon, the effect of a pre existing risk, cardiovascular risk profile. Clearly, in children, this is uh, not uh, uh, the situation, but in the long term, also clearly, any damaging action of post meal can have a very dangerous effect on any organ, but particularly on cardiovascular system. So, um, I think that it's important to underline that, um, unfortunately, the mechanisms are the same in children and adults, and probably they are uh, similarly dangerous. You see that in people, uh, normal people, um, what happens is that uh, in uh, the postprandial hyperglycemia is always very, in a very strict control, but when you have a huge increase, particularly this happens in diabetes, in pre-diabetes, in obesity, so this is a quite common situation, you after the, the ingestion of a meal, you have an increase of postprandial hyperglycemia. And there are some aspects of this uh, postprandial hyperglycemia. One is uh, the absolute increase, meaning the higher uh, value of a glycemia which can be reached after the ingestion of meal, but also, uh, also interesting is the PPG increment, meaning the difference between the pre-meal value and after meal value of glycemia, which can be itself a very dangerous. Higher is the peak, meaning the difference between basal glycemia and the uh, post-meal hyperglycemia, higher is also the possibility to produce a damage. First of all, let's clarify, because many studies in humans are um, referring to the studies performing, which were performed using an OGTT. And one of the main issues always have been, has been, uh, is an OGTT equivalent to the, a normal meal? This study is the key answer. Because in this study, people, uh, normal people, people with pre-diabetes and people with the over-diabetes, they had an oral glucose tolerance 10 or GTT, but also they had a mixed meal and also they had home glucose monitoring. So three situations completely different. And the aim of the study was to look at how much the glycemia during an OGTT can predict or can superimpose to the glycemia during a mixed meal, but particularly 
to the glycemia at home in the, during a normal life. And what emerged is that there is a very strong correlation between all these three different glycemias, meaning what, that what you see during an OGTT also happens during a normal life. And this, of course, validated the, the, the majority of the studies which were performed using an OGTT. However, you know, probably you know that seven years ago, the International Diabetes Federation um, set up some specific guidelines for the management of post-spin glucose, of course, in diabetes, because uh, this is, was uh, the main uh, task at that time. Uh, I was chairing this and it was a really an important experience. But at that time, and until a few years ago, I have to say, we were just looking at the value of a glycemia after two hours. I have to say that it was quite wrong, according to what is emerging. Because now we have evidence that what happens after one hour, after the ingestion of a meal, can be even more dangerous than the value uh, that we see after two hours. And the reason is uh, quite easy to understand. Because usually at one hour, not only during an OGTT, of course, but even during a meal, the, the, at one hour, you have uh, the higher increase of postprandial hyperglycemia. And so the very simple explanation why one hour value can be more dangerous than two hours is because usually at an hour, the, the absolute value of glycemia is higher than at the two hours. So very simple explanation, but with a huge impact in the clinical management, particularly of the diabetes. And this is an example why it is, is very important uh, uh, today with the, the possibility to look at the mean glycemia during the day. And uh, what if we had available until a few years ago, meaning that the glucose monitoring, as you see, was not, not enough to catch really the peaks of glycemia. And now to, today, using continuous glucose monitoring, we are able to really see what happens in 24 hours, and particularly to, um, to be able to, uh, to see where are, when and where are the peaks and to which meal, for example, which kind of meals they are linked. These premises were quite, I believe, important in order to show where we are moving in terms of uh, um, evaluation of postprandial hyperglycemia in terms of uh, timing. But of course, what is important to, to, for my presentation is to understand why any acute increase of glucose, and this explains why one hour glucose could be more dangerous than two hour glucose after uh, the meal ingestion, can produce so damaging effect. So this is, I just um, underline that it's very important to understand why in an acute increase of glycemia, can have a so damaging effect on any kind of tissue. This is an hypothesis which we published some years ago now, but is still valid. <laughs> and uh, linking what happens when you eat a lot and you are a quite sedentary life, we have a lot of sedentary lifestyle. This means in absolute terms that you have a huge increase of glucose and free fatty acid, which of course they are the uh, fuel to produce energy for any living uh, organism. And this overload of uh, the gluco, uh, glucose and uh, lipids can produce a glucose and lipotoxicity, so generating an oxidative stress, which at the level of a different tissue, for example, at the level of uh, adipose tissue of uh, skeletal muscle can produce insulin resistance, at the level of endothelium, endothelial dysfunction, which can turn, can lead to atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, but also at, at, at specifically at the level of pancreas, the imagined beta cells, so favoring the appearance of overt diabetes. This is just a, a, a simplified uh, um, uh, approach to my uh, explanation of what I just said, meaning that we, we eat just to have available glucose and fat to, in order to produce energy. Energy, which in biochemically is, uh, uh, in, uh, is going this way. Glucose and free fatty acid are 
transformed in acetyl coenzyme A, which at the level of mitochondria, of course, this is very roughly explanation, but anyhow, the level of mitochondria is used uh, use, uh, uh, together with oxygen to produce ATP, meaning energy. What happens when you overload the system? Meaning you eat a lot, <laughs> you have a lot of uh, uh, high glucose, for example, that at the level particularly of the mitochondria respiratory chain, there is an overgeneration of free radicals. And though this is a, 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 a nice explanation published uh, by Michael Brownlee some years ago in Nature on how and hyperglycemia, acute increase of a glycemia, but also we will see soon an acute increase of a free fatty acid can induce a generation of oxidative stress, which at the end of the day is supposed to be the key player of any organ damage we see during an acute increase of a hyperglycemia, including, of course, postprandial hyperglycemia. The hypothesis that today is really well recognized. This has been, there are many, many papers uh, confirming this, uh, um, this uh, map, uh, pathways. In hyperglycemia, during acute, particularly during an acute increase of hyperglycemia, at the mitochondrial level, you have an overgeneration of mitochondria, which can activate, as you see, several pathways, all together leading to the appearance of endothelial dysfunction, which at the end of the day turns in the appearance of diabetic complications in diabetes, but even in non-diabetes, but in pre-diabetes can impact the appearance, particularly of cardiovascular complications. Where are the, pro the proof for this? For example, this is a study showing that when you produce an acute hyperglycemia in normal people, in pre-diabetes people, or in people with over-diabetes, you, you are able to induce an endothelial dysfunction, which is accompanied by parallel increase of oxidative stress. As you see, higher is glycemia, higher is the impact on endothelial dysfunction, and in the generation of oxidative stress. But another proof was to modulate postprandial hyperglycemia. And we were able to do this using, uh, for example, different uh, kind of insulin. We were using a, a rapid insulin, but also a, a new analog at that time, Aspart, which were able to produce a different increase of postprandial hyperglycemia. And you see here that modulating postprandial hyperglycemia, you have a different effect on the appearance of endothelial dysfunction and on terms of oxidative stress generation. So higher was postprandial hyperglycemia, more, high, more dangerous was the impact on endothelial dysfunction, higher was the generation of oxidative stress. And this has been, this, the role of oxidative stress has been also confirmed using an antioxidant. Of course, the principle is that if oxidative stress is the key player, if you reduce oxidative stress, you can blunt somehow the effect of high acute hyperglycemia. And you see here that using glutathione, which is a very well recognized strong antioxidant, the effect of inducing acute hyperglycemia on uh, some, um, on the, in this case, systolic blood pressure, which is an equivalent of endothelial dysfunction, was really blunted, meaning the end. As you see, ocreotide, which is a somatostatin analog, in this way, you block insulin secretion. So you, what you see is just related to the effect of hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia induced endothelial dysfunction, but infusing glutathione, so reducing the oxidative stress generation, you, of course, you counterbalance the effect of acute hyperglycemia. And we were looking just at endothelial dysfunction, which of course, we know today is a really key early player in the development of a cardiovascular disease. But what about specifically the effect on myocardium? I believe that this study coming from the Padua is quite interesting because they, as similarly to our study, they modulated the increase of postprandial hyperglycemia, but they were measuring the heart performance. And you see here, that reducing postprandial hyperglycemia was uh, able, first of all, high glucose, acute hyperglycemia, hyperglycemia induced in heart dysfunction, 
which is very, very important in terms of explaining the mechanism in leading to heart failure and diabetes. But anyhow, controlling postprandial hyperglycemia, the effect on myocardium of acute hyperglycemia was significantly reduced. And of course, if you we see, uh, if we will look at the effect of postprandial hyperglycemia on the atherosclerosis generation progression, it's also important to have a look at LDL oxidation. And again, we were able to show that modulating postprandial hyperglycemia, but please, in this case, not using insulin, but just using a different content in the you know, carbohydrates in the meal, which is, fits with the concept of, you know, of a glycemic index, you see that higher was the level of glycemia, higher was the level of LDL oxid oxidation, meaning that postprandial hyperglycemia can favor also in this way, increasing generation of LDL oxidation can favor the, the appearance of atherosclerosis. And finally, you know that the, an important uh, contributor to atherosclerosis is the thrombus formation. Uh, it's well recognized today that uh, coagulation plays a key role in the final stage of atherosclerosis, not only in the acute, effect, acute uh, cardiovascular disease appearance, but of course in the establishment of atherosclerosis at the artery level. And we were able to demonstrate, again modulating postprandial hyperglycemia, first that acute increase of postmilglycemia increases the thrombosis, but modulating the, this, this increase, you can reduce the effect on thrombosis activation. And this has been um, uh, just uh, more uh, confirmed with uh, another drug similarly to acarbose, meaning modulating again postprandial hyperglycemia, but in this case, looking at the effect on endothelial dysfunction with people with acute coronary syndrome, meaning an acute phase of a coronary syndrome, an increase of glycemia with the meal can worsen the situation, but you can modulate this, modulating postprandial hyperglycemia. I believe that nobody is paying so much attention to what happens when this kind of patients are eating, and on the contrary, this is, will be also very important to have a modulation for sprandial hyperglycemia in order to improve uh, the prognosis. And also, what happens in the long term when you modulate for sprandial hyperglycemia? This is a nice study coming from a group in uh, Naples, Italy. Why is this a study, nice study? Because they were modulate when they were treating a group of patients of diabetic patients in uh, with the two different drugs, but one particularly one was repaglinide, particularly for, um, targeting postprandial hyperglycemia, and another one was uh, a sulfonylurea, particularly targeting fasting glycemia. You see uh, the effect, different effect on postprandial hyperglycemia and on the fasting glycemia of these two drugs. However. Why this study is important? Because at the end of the trial, the, the, the decrease of A1C was equivalent. So what we see in terms of outcome is not related to overall glycemic control, but a specific effect in decreasing PPG or fasting glucose. And you see that the decreasing postprandial hyperglycemia, you dramatically improve the, uh, the um, carotidema media thickness progression and this is also accompanied by a significant decrease of mar some markers of inflammation like uh, 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 interleukin-6 or CRP. So this study is a, a key demonstration that acting and increasing postprandial hyperglycemia, you can somehow stop the progression of atherosclerosis. And because we are in a meeting with a nutritionist, I think that this study is uh, really very interesting for them, for all of us, but particularly for who is uh, engaged in the nutrition. You see that in this uh, um, study, um, the, 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 it was evaluated the effect of uh, diets with a different glycemic index on endothelial function and glycemic variability in overweight and obese adults at increased cardiovascular risk. 
and you see that modulating using the, the diet uh, a low glycemic index this was really impacting in improving uh, the endothelial function but also in decreasing glycemic variability which today is considered another key player in the, the appearance of a diabetic complication so, or any complication related to uh, well, fluctuation of glucose. And, but also, we, what we speak about postprandial hyperglycemia, we cannot forget that um, the meal is not only composed by carbohydrates. We, fortunately, I used to say, we, need to, we eat food, which are complex. Of course, they also have fats. And it's well known that an acute increase of uh, fats, uh, triglyceride in particularly, or NIFA, can produce an endothelial dysfunction. This is a key study published several years ago. An infusion, intralipid infusion. Intralipid is a, a, a huge amount of lipids that you infuse. And together with heparin, which of course uh, is clearing, uh, clearing this uh, effect of uh, free fatty acids, you see that infusing uh, lipids, you produce an endothelial dysfunction. And we were able to show something, in my opinion, very intriguing for the real life. Because I, I repeat, we do not eat only carbohydrates. After the meal, usually you have a combination of an increase of glycemia, but also an increase of a free fatty acid. And we were able to demonstrate that postprandial hyperglycemia can induce endothelial dysfunction and uh, oxidative stress generation. As well, a pure infusion of lipids can induce the same. But when you combine the two, the effect is, real, is, even more, is more and more amplified. So the message is uh, very simple, that in, clinical, in clinically and in, in the life, real life of the people, you have to avoid postprandial hyperglycemia, but also postprandial hypertriglyceridemia because they combine and the final effect is even more dangerous than made by the uh, postprandial hyperglycemia alone. And I just told you the story of uh, glucose variability because when we speak about postprandial hyperglycemia, we cannot believe that you have the increase of glucose just for a few hours after the meal, but this has a tail effect, effect on all the, the glycemia of the day. And today we have a, a strong evidence that when glucose goes up and down, this is even more dangerous than having high constant glucose. In this study, we were able to confirm this in both normal people and diabetic patients where three different experiments were performed. We had high level of glycemia and uh, um, high level, two different high level of glycemia at 15 and 10 millimole liter of glycemia goes, goes up and down every six hours from uh, uh, normal value to 15, back again to 15 millimole liters. Why 15? Because the, uh, the area under the curve, when you use this kind of uh, up and down uh, scheme, is the same that you get when you infuse continuously glucose to have 10 millimole liter constantly for hours. So at the end, I do not want to make a more complicated message. The message is that when glucose goes up and down, this can be even more dangerous than having constant high glucose. And this is also a, para, a, a side effect of the postprandial hyperglycemia because having high postprandial hyperglycemia, you can also induce a glucose variability during the day. And finally, uh, let me joke for a while. Unfortunately, this maybe is not applicable to children, but we were uh, in a two very serious studies, I have to say, we published, you see, the diabetes care one. We were able to show that the effect of postprandial hyperglycemia can be significantly blunted if you drink a good glass of red wine. Why is not surprising? Because red wine is plenty of antioxidants. So even we cannot use this uh, kind of suggestion for children, 
but we can suggest that a meal for the children not only could be, must be, sorry, at low glycemic index. Oh, and this means several so stories, you know, fee sweeteners and so on, but also can be plenty of antioxidants. Simply, for example, eating fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, and so on. So the diet, the, the right approach to control the dangerous effect of postprandial hyperglycemia is not only to lower postprandial hyperglycemia, in this case, probably the best way is to manage the glycemic index, but to really avoid any possible risk to have a, a diet plenty of antioxidant, better if with the fresh fruit or vegetables. And so let me show this final slide, which is the, like a, my historical <laughs> presentation of the concept of postprandial hyperglycemia, because the, the, the suggestion is that like a wave, after the meal, we have a, a, an increase of glycemia, which impacts on endothelial uh, barrier in the arteries, so producing an early atherosclerosis. And uh, I want to finish with, the, in, uh, with the, a more complex story message. But of course, we are focused on the story of postprandial hyperglycemia because this was in really the first evidence that the glycemia is something more complicated than just measuring A1C or fasting glucose. But the modern approach to the management of glycemia today implies not only to control A1C and fasting glucose, not only to avoid short-term and long-term glucose variability, to get as long as possible glycemia in the range of a normal level, but also, you see, to avoid one hour and two hour postprandial hyperglycemia, and in the case of diabetes, to avoid hypoglycemia, also to be careful when you recover from hypoglycemia, how you recover. So as you see today, uh, the concept of glycemia is even more complex as we believe, still just, just a few years uh, ago, and it starts to be more and more complex, but also we have good tools. And honestly, if you see this apparently complex scheme, you can be scared because what can we do to reduce glycemia in all these kinds of glycemia? But as you see, first, probably the key is to have the right diet. To right diet with a good glycemic index, you can avoid all these conditions which are so dangerous for human body. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Antonio, for this great overview. And we already have that, uh, the first question that goes back to your initial remarks, um, stating that children do have a different um, metabolism compared to adults, especially in early life. And knowing such differences, can we still translate the findings from adult studies to children? I, let's say that we have uh, studies performed in uh, uh, type one children. Mm -hmm. Type 1 diabetes children. Of course, I cannot speak about normal people because normal, sorry, normal children, because probably nobody was paying attention to this aspect until now. And also, it's very difficult now to have some, any some sample from this, uh, this population. But in the normal the children with type 1 diabetes, I'm speaking children, not uh, adolescents, so on, even children, all these mechanisms are present meaning there is an increase of oxidative stress after postprandial hyperglycemia and during the glucose variability there is also a, a higher increase of uh, endothelial dysfunction so at least in this sorry to, to say type 1 diabetes as a uh, as experimental <laughs> is not the case but you have this this which indirectly confirms that these pathways are also working in young people they are more protected, probably, not probably, for sure, but they are there, they are dangerous. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Um, you can ask them in the chat or um, directly. Sophie, would you turn on your microphone? 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that the one hour of the postprandially is maybe more important than the usual area under the curve during the four hours or even the, the shape of the curve for two hours. Um, do you consider that now we have to change the, I would say, sort of standard to uh, qualify the glycemic response at the postprandial state and provide more importance of the first hour? Yeah. Uh, uh, I have, uh, the answer is, uh, short answer is yes. Let me explain why, because <laughs> otherwise uh, there is uh, an action uh, at the level of a scientific society, meaning the AESD and so on, uh, to, uh, come to, in order to switch from two hours to an hour, because uh, you just have a professor, we have a publishing diabetes care, a huge meta-analysis, which was a global network action, uh, looking if one hour is more dangerous than two hours, is more predictive for complication or uh, the appearance of diabetes. So this is true. But what, you know what, what, what is the real surprise? If you look at the IDF guidelines, ADA guidelines, uh, American College of Endocrinology guidelines, all are suggesting to measure postprandial hyperglycemia between an hour and an hour and a half, not at two hours. Or the ADA is suggesting at peak, so meaning if the peak is at an hour, we, can, we have to measure at an hour. So the misunderstanding is that in clinical practice, we are using two hours. And this is an old inheritance coming from old studies when the OGTT was the, the, the gold standard and so on. But if you just follow the existing guidelines, you already find this suggestion. So it is not something new, it's there. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another uh, question from Jab Kaye. Would you like to ask your question now? Uh, yes, I, I like to. I'll try to turn on my camera while mm -hmm. I ask. Um, my question is about the oxidative stress. Eh? So, is this for oxidative stress, um, or is this uh, more, say, radicals or less oxidative, uh, less redox defense? Could you elaborate a bit on that? Okay, uh, of course, uh, uh, because of the, the, the topic was humans, I showed only... Oh, sorry, I didn't have my microphone ready. Okay. I got to the question. Thank you. I got yeah. the question. So, the answer is that, of course, I was focused on human studies because of, this was uh, the topic. But the literature is a plenty of evidence in cells and animals that when you have an acute increase of glycemia, an oxidative stress is produced and you find that the let's say the proof, the proofs in the tissues, also in terms of the antioxidant defense response and so on. So this is very well established. The mechanism through which PPG works is an overgeneration of oxidative stress. And also we demonstrated that when it goes up and down, glycemia goes up and down, this is more dangerous because you have a defective intracellular antioxidant defense generation because a specific microRNA, in this case microRNA21, which is modulating GPX for production, mm -hmm. is overexpressed. And it's a paradox that in the, when go, glycemia goes up and down, you have a specific activation of this microRNA, which increases the defense. Nobody knows why this happens to be it, but this is a behavior is coming out uh, as mechanism. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask one final question that is um, relating to, you said that glycemic variability is the problem if we have glucose constantly going up and down. Now we know that as adolescents uh, tend to um, snack more and they tend to extend their consumption window throughout the day until very late at night and that may perhaps also be a problem in terms of the uh, uh, day in diurnal uh, rhythm of insulin uh, sensitivity. Can you comment a little bit on that? Yes, this emerging. And we, have, uh, we started to have data also in the normal population. Uh, particularly, there are uh, huge uh, epidemiological studies coming from Korea, for example, where they have an important database 
and I can anticipate that we have some uh, some good data from uh, uh, cooperating with the Swedish registry, and you know that is a very quite famous epidemiological registry. That even normal population, the glucose variability impacts on the generation of, of uh, the appearance of cardiovascular disease, but also in favoring the appearance of diabetes. So what you, you suggest underline is correct, that probably this continuous issue <laughs> during the day, particularly in children and adolescents, which are mostly always with something in the hand or a better in the mouth, <laughs> because it, it, it's true, can be even more dangerous than to have a, just a huge breakfast, for example, or something like this. Okay. Thank you.